All right, so good morning, everybody. This week on Morning Roll Call, I discuss the tragic week for law enforcement. I talk about the jury decision in the Parkland shooter case. Next, I go to Virginia, where another Soros-backed prosecutor accidentally lets a murder suspect out. Then, a pair of Levi's jeans that sells for an amazing amount of money, but it leaves me asking a question about current quality craftsmanship. Lastly, I discuss transition versus transformation. You know, we talk a lot about transitioning out of law enforcement. And my question is, is that the right word to focus on? Monday Morning Roll Call starts now. All right, welcome everybody to the 127th episode of the podcast. Whether you're watching us on YouTube, you're watching us on Rumble, thank you so much. Uh, As I said last week, if you listened to last week's morning roll call, I just have a few things that I want you to do real quick right now, if you would. First, subscribe or follow on whatever device streaming channel you are on. If you are watching this in video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified uh, every time a new episode releases. And if you would, hit that little like button as well and leave the comments. I can't tell you how much all of that helps us uh, every week. And thank you to all of you who've been doing that. Second, be sure to follow us on your favorite social media channel. We're pretty much on all of them, and it's at On The Blue Line Podcast. And then thirdly is our On The Blue Line community, which is on Facebook. So if you just go to On The Blue Line community and go to the Facebook page, uh, we would love to have you join us in there. And in there, uh, we actually take a lot of the topics and stuff here. And I push those out to the group and I ask some questions and you're going to be seeing more of that uh, as we do some other things in the community space here in the weeks ahead. So please be sure to join us there. Uh, This is, if you've not seen the show before, this is called Morning Roll Call. It's just a weekly monologue show, 20, 30 minutes that I get to spend here with you. I tell you a few uh, news stories that might matter to you. We go over a couple crazy things and then I leave you with something to think about, hopefully something actionable for the week ahead. The other show is the interview room and that currently releases on thursdays uh we got some cool things happening in that space as well i'm not going to talk about them yet but uh hopefully there's going to be some changes that you're going to like uh coming up with the interview room but in the meantime it releases every thursday at 5 a.m last week was jasmine peach if you missed that interview uh just really her strength uh in talking about what she went through at the department and uh, dealing with vulnerability and it's just a powerful message and there's some really good takeaways in that one and this coming week is sergeant michael sagru and uh, retired sergeant michael sagru and we talk about the uh, book that he wrote and what he's doing in the mental health space so you are not going to want to miss that episode and that is this thursday at 5 a.m so uh without taking more time let's get to this week's episode of morning roll call All right, everybody. So let's just get through a couple news stories. Uh, firstly is the tragic story that everybody is aware of. If you've watched the news over the last week, uh, essentially the National Fraternal Order of Police had put out a Twitter uh, tweet, I guess is the proper terminology, not a Twitter. They put out a tweet on Twitter um, on October 13th. And sadly, since Monday, so um, going back the week before, at least 12 police officers have been shot. Uh, The spewing, and this was what they said about it, the spewing of anti-police rhetoric by some political and media figures, as well as failed policies of rogue prosecutors and judges are placing our officers in greater danger. This culture of lawlessness must stop, and I couldn't agree more. I think think that last line actually tells a lot, because as we've talked about on this podcast and I've heard others, there is certainly something to be said for kind of this degradation of society that's going on as well. So they definitely highlighted some of the issues and maybe what you could even argue are starting points with some of this. However, uh, when we are in such moral decline and uh, many of the things that we are accepting is okay, and when we're calling good evil or calling, yeah, when we're calling good evil and evil good, uh, sadly, this is the next iteration of that. So they then break down uh, three police officers, and I'm sure you, most of my listeners saw this on social media because I know this was on most of the accounts uh, that I am on, but three police officers were shot and two were killed in Bristol, Connecticut, uh, responding to a domestic violence incident. Uh, That one they actually believe could have very well been a uh, a phony attempt to lure and ambush the responding police. 35-year-old Sergeant Dustin DeMonte and 34-year-old Alex Hamsey uh, with Bristol Police were also slain, and a third officer is alive uh, after gunshot wounds. 
There was uh, three Philadelphia SWAT officers that went to serve a murder warrant, and they ended up in the hospital with gunshot wounds. And uh, what I found astonishing is they kind of give us a breakdown. So according to the National Fraternal, Fraternal Order of Police, as of July 31st, 210 officers have been shot in line of duty. 39 uh, have resulted in death of those 210, and those numbers are up 14% from last year. Of the shootings that have taken place so far this year, 46 were reported to be ambush style. And of course, anyone in law enforcement knows what that means, but they go on to explain this. Carried out with an element of surprise and intended to deprive officers of their ability to defend against the attack. So it, just be on safeguard out there. We are in, we're in times that uh, you, you hear the word unprecedented and whatever that means. But we certainly are in times that I never thought we'd see in our lifetime. And uh, as we continue with the moral decline, coupled with many of the things that were listed in there, and some of the things we're going to talk about yet in this podcast, uh, sadly, the people on the front lines, the men and women in law enforcement and first responders in general, are definitely going to be in a dangerous position. So our thoughts and prayers are with you for your safety. And uh, that makes everything we're doing here all the more important. So uh, that's all I have to say on that right now. So... The second news story, which again, I'm sure everybody heard about. These aren't surprise news stories to you, but I just want to point something out. So this is in reference to the Parkland shooter case. And I'm going to say the same thing that a lot of people have said. So essentially, according to the jury foreman, three of the 12 jurors opted for the life sentence in this case. Uh, for a reminder, again, I'm sure everyone knows, but this is the school shooter, the Parkland school shooter, who pled guilty to 17 counts of murder, 14 of the, which were students. And um, according to the jury foreman, there was one individual that had a hard no, and then two others ended up voting with her is essentially how that went when in Florida it has to be unanimous for it to be a death sentence. Let me first, I want to go over, uh, this is coming from another news article, uh, Parkland parents decry jury decision against death sentence for Nicholas Cruz. If you would go to onthebluelinecom go to the show notes page, all the show notes are there, all the links, everything I discuss you can uh, find right there and there's a transcription of every episode so you can always look up specific information. But this is an article that discusses things that the parents said uh, and other family members in light of the uh, sentencing ruling or the decision to spare his life in the sentencing phase. So uh, Mike Schulman, whose son Scott Bagel uh, was a geography teacher, wrote this an or stated that this animal deserves to die. He hunted these people. He planned this for months. Um, the wife of a slang athletic director, Deborah Hickson, uh, the last thing my son saw was the gunman aiming at him. Um, her family uh, and her were completely devastated and shocked. Uh, what it says to me, what it says to my family, what it says to the other families is that his, referring to uh, the suspect's life, meant more than the 17 that were murdered. And you can just really, as you read through here, feel the pain that the uh, family is uh, laying out. And essentially, the juror members that they spoke to felt that there were mitigating circumstances. That's why they didn't vote uh, for the death penalty. They felt that due to some mental health, possible concerns, and his upbringing is why they considered those mitigating circumstances and why they opted for life imprisonment instead of the death penalty. Uh, this uh, Tony Mont Matado, uh, his daughter Gina, was among the students that were gunned down. I promise you throughout this nation, there are people who had a more difficult time growing up than this shooter. They did not choose to enter a school with a high powered weapon and pull the trigger 139 individual times. That should have been punished to the maximum extent of the law. Gina, my beautiful, kind, bubbly, bright daughter deserved better than she got from the schools and certainly from this jury. Uh, when asked uh, what he had to say to those who opposed the death penalty or argued that life sentence itself was brutal punishment, he stated, I'll trade places with you. Trade places with me. You'll change your mind. And you can feel the pain in that father's uh, statement as well as the others who were there. And it does leave me asking a question that I heard on a lot of other news stories or, or another, a lot of news channels and uh, people talking. But it's really this idea that this isn't a statement either for or against the death penalty. Um, anyone that knows me knows my thoughts are pretty clear on the matter. But here is my question. 
if you're going to have a death penalty, what is the case that justifies using it? If not the murder of 17 innocent lives that is planned and carried out at a school, then when is that time? Like, what is the death penalty for? And that, that would be my question. And I really don't. And, and I get that, you know, it, it kind of all depends on who, what is the makeup of the jury and what the feelings are of those people. I know uh, I heard a thing where Bill O'Reilly, I believe he was actually on the Glenn Beck program, and I heard him talking. And uh, Bill was saying, hey, listen, I, I'm not for the death penalty. I'm not for any sort of state government involved uh, murder. I'm not for, and this was his, him talking. He said, I'm not for abortion. I'm not for uh, the death penalty. And uh, he said, but, but what I am for is like hard labor. So uh, in his idea of justice, he said, you know, I wish there was a hard labor option, something, you know, where you're not just sitting in some cushy jail cell and, you know, working out your master's degrees and doctor's degrees and so forth on the state dime. So there's a lot of different opinions on this, but even even with what he said, and I, I disagree with Bill on a few things he said, but even on what Bill said, I would come full circle on this and say, if you have a death penalty, which Florida does, what is the case that it applies to if you as a juror don't feel that this is the one? And I, I get the mental health argument in there, you know, and again, I wasn't there. Maybe there was some evidence that was produced that would sway me, though I find that highly unlikely in this situation, but uh, just something to think about. So I, I did also hear that there's been a couple of videos that have come out since I prepped for this episode. So I'm sure there's more information. It's not something I want to spend a lot of time on, but if something that I think is important comes up that needs to be shared with you uh, by me as part of Morning Roll Call, I will be sure to do it. So the third story I want to bring to you is titled, Whoops, Soros-backed prosecutor in Virginia mistakenly freed murder suspect. I will say this. When I first looked at this article, you get one idea of what that means, and it's not really what happened. And I, I'm usually on the side of those who wrote this, so it's kind of one of those things where, you know, we, we get, especially on the conservative side of the house, right? And I, I consider myself more on the conservative side, obviously. If you listen to the show, that's not really a surprise. And we have an expectation that you have to give honest news like information should be true shouldn't be misleading you know we hear all this misinformation and we know that most of the people that use the term misinformation are the worst proprietors and perpetrators of spreading dis and misinformation but that being said that expectation then means that when we uh, write an article or we talk about something we need to hold ourselves to that same standard right so that'd be my expectation in this article. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying that what the front says and what the end says is a little different. But I did find it to be interesting and that's why I brought it to you. So essentially, uh, this guy, and if you're watching on the screen, you'll see a photo of him here. He was mistakenly freed and pretty much the whole thing was a paperwork issue. And the sheriff comes out of the area in Loudoun County and talks about this case and pretty much blames the DA for incompetence. And I'm not saying that that is, or the prosecutor for incompetence. And I'm not saying that that isn't a true statement. Again, I don't know, but I found it interesting. So the office of Loudoun County prosecutor, uh, Buddha, I am going to so mispronounce her name, but Biberaj, maybe on Thursday dropped a second degree murder charges in general district. And essentially what happened is it was a paperwork issue. So they failed to get the new charges approved in time before canceling the old ones or dropping the old charges. So when all that happened, they let this guy out and he ends up running away 600 miles away, which can't say necessarily if they opened the door. I mean, you know, so the a former prosecutor there said that the screw up he believed was avoidable and that this was more of an incompetence. And they pointed out that in February, the prosecutor, the same prosecutor was under fire for hiring a registered sex offender because they didn't perform a background check. Uh, Loudoun County judge also kicked this prosecutor off of a case in June because she did not mention a defendant's past robbery charges in a plea agreement. So there's been some issues. And I think the reason the headlines are written the way it is, is because she is one of several where Soros's Justice and Public Safety Pact donated more than half a million dollars to their campaigns to get them elected. So there's already a stigma, and then when you couple it with what you're seeing and this what they're terming as incompetence, it makes you wonder. Uh, essentially, the suspect Coburn, the guy that was let go, he's the one that had um, 
The murder happened in their home in Virginia in front of the couple's nine-month-old daughter, uh, where I believe he had stabbed her, if I'm correct, and then stuffed her in a trash can. So there's all this going on, and essentially the transfer of the individual was completely botched. They ended up fixing it, and they got him. Um, I don't think there was anything for Loudoun County Sheriff to hold the defendant on, when the murder charge in the general district was dismissed the same day. So essentially because they had the one case dismissed before the other one came through, it the guy essentially fell through the cracks. So uh, the public defender in Loudoun County said that the, the office did file the paperwork, but it had not been entered or followed up with to ensure that the KPS, the arrest order, was in fact issued prior to the murder charge being dropped. Bibaraj. Uh, did come out with a press release that said that they didn't feel that this was necessarily fair and that they did, the prosecutors did not file the new charges until the following day. She deflected blame for the release, saying she was greatly disappointed that the sheriff's account mischaracterizes the release of Colburn and their lack of accountability. I will say this, right? So regardless where you fall on this and where you fall on where she's getting her funding and some of that political side of that, I, I do think there is a valid argument, a valid question that we need to consider as far as why can why do we live in a time where people at all businesses and all levels of government, and especially jobs like that where it's super important, don't take time for attention to detail and creating safeguards where mistakes like that don't easily happen. That's what baffles me, especially when they pointed out multiple other issues, like not doing the previous background check and stuff. If you're finding you have a lot of these I would argue major issues. They may be small in the moment, but they create really big issues like, hey, this murderer just left because we opened the door for him. I think it's time that maybe you look at accountability. And so again, not a political issue, just an issue that if uh, you're not taking accountability for things in your life, maybe it's time to start. All right. So this week's one crazy thing really isn't all that crazy, but it is kind of interesting, I thought. So the article coming to us from CNN yeah, I know. CNN style, though, is 19th century Levi's jeans found in a mine shaft sell for $87,000 for a pair of blue jeans. Now, granted, you wouldn't still be alive to um, sell them, but that's not bad if you want to hold on to your jeans for a very long time. A pair of Levi jeans from the 1880s, they were found inside an abandoned mine by a denim archaeologist. When I first read this article, and if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see the picture of the jeans, which are in really astonishingly good shape. I didn't know a denim archaeologist was a thing, first of all. Anyway, found that out. Actually learned a couple things, which I'm going to pass on to you, which is why I want to talk about this. This is the highest prices um, ever paid for a pair of denims. And these jeans are extremely rare, especially in the fantastic worn condition and size, as you're seeing on the actual screen. Um, they go on to talk about these are Levi and Strauss jeans and how surprisingly durable they were and that they could remain in such good condition all this time later. Um, average vintage jeans are usually worth around $100. So I found that amazing that on average they're around 100 and these sold for 87000 That could actually be an indication of inflation too. Maybe that is about the same uh, in the current America. But... Uh, there was a, something on the inside pocket, which obviously talks to the historical time and, you know, it's not something, you know, something we look back at disparagingly, but I thought it was interesting because I never, I didn't really know any of this as when it comes to uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, from history. So essentially the inside pocket, which is, you see on the screen there, but the inside pocket is printed with the phrase, the only kind made by white labor, end quote. And so speaking with the Levi spokesperson, the company used that slogan after the introduction of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which barred Chinese laborers from entering the U.S. So essentially, I looked that act up, and there's some links if you want to go to the show notes, but uh, where they suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years, and they declared uh, Chinese immigrants ineligible for naturalization. So during that 10 to 20 year period... This is one of the things they were putting on these jeans to point out that they were one of the only jeans that were um, made by white labor. So um, definitely speaks to a, you know, a different time, uh, maybe a different time in America, but quite an interesting story. And the fact that they sold for $87,000, hold on to your jeans. You never know what might happen in uh, 
over 100 years. All right, for the one important takeaway this week, I just want to talk about two words, which is kind of a play on words a little bit, I guess. But I was listening to a podcast, and I heard them make a statement along these lines. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, hmm, that actually is a really good point, especially for law enforcement, right? And it's this idea of transition versus transformation. So you hear the word transition a lot when you talk about law enforcement, military, and others. Any of these careers that you usually go to younger early 20s, et cetera, and then you, and late teens, you know, especially in the military, and you have a retirement option in the 20, 25, or 30 year range, because you're often in a position where you can then transition out of the military and then into, oftentimes, a lot of them will, a lot of people will trans will transition from military into law enforcement, as many of you know. So it's not an uncommon thought, and it, my concerns with the word transition, right? And transition is defined as the process or a period of changing from one state or a condi or one state or condition to another. So it, to me, it kind of denotes this thinking, the someday clause, right? That's what I call it, because that's the trap that I find myself in a lot, right? It's that this is, I'm going to do X when, but we don't define X. Well, we often will sometimes define X, but it's something we're dreaming about. What we don't define is the when. And it's, well, when I retire, when I transition out, when I, you know, I'm doing all these things. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But sadly, what I see is a lot of times people talking about it, not so much from a true goal setting planning statement, but rather from a someday win statement. And the problem is, as we all know, if you're always planning for tomorrow, tomorrow never comes, same is true as someday. If you're always planning on someday, then it never actually gets here. And then oftentimes we don't really put the steps in place that we need to be where we wanna be when the time comes. The other thing is, is we don't think of ourselves as marketable, right? Or get the skill sets, get the things in place that allows us to be the person or have the skill set that's going to get us what we're wanting when the time comes. For instance, you're in the service, and uh, you know, depending on what your MOS is and so forth. But you know, are you getting those marketable skills, especially in law enforcement? Are you making sure that you're getting the skills and the trainings and the experience that's going to allow you to do something on the once you transition or go out of that job? So the more I thought about it, I kind of like this idea of using the word transformation instead. And that's what I heard the host of this podcast talk about. And if I could remember for the life of me the name of the podcast, I would tell you about it. So I am sorry to whomever I heard this on, but they were kind of talking about it. And then I just wanted to go deeper with it. And it's this whole idea of transformation, right? So if transition is just moving, right, from one point to another, or from going from one area to another area, then transformation really is more metamorphosis, right? It's what we talk about with animals. It's the transformation from the immature form. And when I read that, I love that thought. Because in many ways, whether we're talking transition in the vocational sense, I'm moving from one job to another, or we're talking on life skills and being ready for a different uh, stage in life, transformation is what it's all about. It's not simply the movement, because movement can be both progressive and regressive. Like just simply moving doesn't mean it's better. It doesn't mean that you're improving. It doesn't even mean that you're becoming the kind of person that's going to do better in that new environment. Transformation, on the other hand, that is a radical transformation or drastic change. It's, be, it's transformation from the immature form. In other words, I'm going to get better, be better, and then move on to whatever is the calling or the thing that I'm supposed to do next. So it led me to how can you, how can we transform? So I just want to give you a couple of them. I actually uh, jotted down more than 12 of them. So I really condensed them down to what I considered the top three. And then the others I'll go over in a different format at a later time. But first, uh, first off, and when I talk about this, I'm not, again, talking about so much the vocational side. I'm talking about you and I. We're in this career, right? And this career can really take over our lives. And if you have young children, if you're building a family and you're doing all these things, then you probably don't have much time left. And when you, and when I say you don't have much time left, you don't have much open time in your schedule. In fact, what open time you have 
is probably some sort of crashing to get ready for whatever's next. In other words, you come home from work, work a 12 hour shift, you've got a young baby, uh, maybe it's like a split uh, sleep schedule because maybe you're working nights. So uh, maybe your wife or your husband works a different schedule. So you're sleeping for like two or three hours and now you're on baby duty. And I, I hear all sorts of iterations of that. I hear all sorts of iterations, like in my case, where you've got a business and stuff that you're trying to run. So, it, you know, it's work all day, then you're doing the business and then you're immediately going back into work. And so those little pockets of time that you're off, you're really just crashing. So what I encourage you to do and uh, this is really something we're even working on in the community and some other things that we're doing is spend time thinking about that situation and what can I do without crashing, without burnout, again, something else we talk a lot about, what can I do to get to that next step? So first of all, decide to transform. And I know that sounds trite, you know, you're like, yeah, 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 Dis okay, I'm just gonna, you know, decide, right? Well, you have to start there, right? You have to consider where you are and where you want to be. In the illustration I gave, you have to be honest with yourself to say, okay, you know what? I have an extra hour a week or I have an extra whatever it is, 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week. And if that is the case, then that's where you need to think about, okay, what is the next trajectory? I recently had a conversation with a uh, deputy and uh, they were thinking about, um, well, a, a young law enforcement officer. And, and that young law enforcement officer was like, well, I'm trying to think throughout my career, what do I want to do when both in the career and after the career? So then it really becomes a strategy, right? You could kind of sit down and say, all right, well, if we do these things, if you go into these units, you know, I, I love finance. And so when I get done with my career, I want to become a financial investigator. Okay, well, that is probably a road that's going to take you through some investigative roles that is going to help build out your ability in some sort of financial investigations and set you up with the tools so when you leave the career you're able to do that that's just one example right but it starts with deciding that i want to change who i am and that's just one example it can be deeper than that it can be broader than that it can be more superficial than that in everything you know, Dave Ramsey has that little statement where he says, when we live like no one else, then one day we can live like no one else. Well, that is exactly what we're talking about here, right? If we're willing to be not be like everybody else and just it, fall into this trap of burnout and this cycle where we just feel like we're on a hamster wheel all the time, and instead we interject intentionality, that's what this decide is all about, then in those moments we have a chance of breaking outside the cycle. So the first one is deciding to transform. Second is embracing the suck, which is something we hear all the time, or discomfort, right? This is the do hard things mantra. And you're like, well, yeah, but that, you know, that kind of seems like maybe more of a military mindset or in, in certain environments, it is probably more natural. But the problem is, is a lot of times we don't want to challenge ourselves anymore. I see this even with myself, right? In fact, I was recently talking to some people where I would say, hey, listen, I just don't know, you know, I don't really feel like being that uncomfortable anymore. Well, that's a scary thing. Scary from the standpoint of when we're not uncomfortable, we're not growing, right? You know, we've all heard, I actually was listening to it's a Bible Jazz podcast, and it wasn't, I was recently on that show, and I'll be linking up in the show notes when uh, my episode releases, but in preparation for that show, I was listening to a few of his uh, previous guests, and in one of them, we've all heard the uh, biblical statement, iron sharpens iron, right? And when, when you think of sharpening anything you know there there's a heat to that process there's there's a stone there is, you know there, that's a harsh process sharpening a blade and i loved what this young lady said where she said well we're not pillow sharpening pillows and that's been stuck with me ever since but really right now in uh where we are in this modern age that's kind of the way we are we're pillow sharpening pillows which uh, by the way maybe i gotta get with her and tell her that ought to be a great book name but Really, we have to step away from that. It needs to be uncomfortable. If we want to be iron sharpening iron, if we want to be strong in our lives, if we want to make strong decisions, if we want to transform, if we want to you know, move beyond that juvenile form and we're going to transform into what we're meant to be, you have to do hard things. And then lastly, and the last one I want to leave you with is focus on one thing at a time, right? This is that acronym, focus, focus on one course until successful, right? For the acronym for focus. You're still working. You have time. You don't, you don't have to hit this home run today. It's something I'm constantly having to remind myself of, right? Because where I want to be is where I hope this is in 10 years. And I want to be there 
Well, how about like today? Yeah, like uh, today, if that would work. No, but that's not reality, right? And when we put that much pressure on ourselves, then a lot of times what we do is we end up in more of a scattered type approach instead of focusing on, okay, what is the next step that's going to get me to whatever that dream, that goal, that aspiration that I have so I can get there and then get to the next level. So that's what I encourage you on this week, whether uh, you're in a point in life where you're thinking about transition or maybe you're years away from any sort of transition in your career, but you're at a point that transforming your life, who you are, and getting ready for what is gonna be next and the great things I know you're going to do, well, if you're there, now's the time to be thinking about it. That's the one thing I want you to think about this week. Okay, for this last section, let me read one of the reviews to you. This one is coming to us from iTunes or po Apple Podcast. I'm sorry. I don't know why I always want to call it iTunes, but coming to us from Apple Podcast, please, whatever uh, resource you are, source you are listening to us on, please leave us a rating and review. And uh, five stars would be the appropriate number of stars. And then the reviews go a long ways, and I will read it on a future episode. Uh, definitely try to leave them for us on Apple Podcast and on YouTube because on both of those, they help a lot with the algorithms. This one is coming to us from Captain Bob W. It says, Wayne has a great podcast, definitely a must listen. He has discussed perspectives that have caused me to reflect on my own career, remember things, influences I'd completely forgotten about, and his discussions will, age your, will aid your overall well, and I'm thinking being, but it dropped off. So thank you very much, Captain. I appreciate you leaving us a rating review. And for all of you out there, please, uh, if you get a chance, just hit on whatever source you are listening to it. But that's all I have for you on this week's Morning Roll Call. I will see you next Thursday in the interview room. But in the meantime, I'll see you on the blue line.